Suppose you have just been retained by an insurance company whose insured has just received a statement of claim arising out of a motor vehicle accident which happened in March of this year. Your insurer insures the driver of the car who rear-ended the plaintiff's vehicle. In his statement of claim, the plaintiff is alleging severe whiplash. She says she, uh, er, in her statement of claim, the plaintiff is alleging severe whiplash. She says she cannot work, and she cannot take care of her house or her yard. She can't dance. She can't take part in her usual pre-accident activities. The medical information which you, as counsel for the defense, has indicates no fractures or organic basis for her complaints. And she pleads that she is depressed as a result of her injuries, the injuries which she says she sustained in the accident. You know that in February of this year, about one and a half months before the accident, she was laid off from her job and had been unable to find work before the accident. So you know that she was unemployed at the date of the accident. So you know that she has good economic reason to malinger and to be otherwise depressed. If you immediately commission a cameraman to follow her and videotape her activities. If you obtain evidence of this woman shoveling her garden or doing the Charleston, will you have to disclose that on an examination for discovery? Will you have to tell the plaintiff that you have a film showing digging and dancing? Or will you have to go further? Will you have to describe the size of the shovel the depth of the hole, the type of the dance, the height of the kick. It seems clear, on the basis of the cases which I've referred to in my paper, that you won't actually have to hand over the videotape, as it was prepared in contemplation of litigation and it's privileged. It also seems fairly clear that you must mention the existence of the videotape in your affidavit of documents. What is unclear, and remains unclear at this time, is how much will you be obliged to disclose on the examination for discovery? Are the detailed contents of the videotape, uh, must you tell the, the detailed contents of the videotape to the other side? Now, if we go back a little, even before the new rules, and I think we've got to stop calling them the new rules, even before the new rules came into effect, a party had an obligation to disclose material facts, whether or not the facts were contained in privileged documents. If one looks at my paper, you'll see reference, for instance, to the Cook decision, which was a divorce case involving allegations of adultery, which was decided before the new rules came into effect. In that case, the wife's investigator had obtained information about the alleged adultery, and the issue in the case was whether the wife was required to disclose the contents of the investigation. Even at that time, Mr. Justice Gale, as he then was, ordered disclosure of the material facts, and he limited the disclosure to the room and the hours in which the adultery was said to have occurred. Now, under the old rules, a party had a duty to disclose facts, but not evidence. And that's where the problem is created now. The distinction between facts and evidence has been abolished. But where does that leave us in our example with the videotape? What is fact? What is evidence? How far do we have to go in our disclosure? Now, based on the materials uh, contained in my paper, it appears that on discovery, it is probably necessary, in our videotape example, to disclose the fact that the plaintiff has been observed by someone at the request of defense counsel. And the cases are in the paper. It's probably necessary to say when and over what period of time. And it is probably also necessary, in the example that I use, although it's sort of unclear, that it's necessary to generally disclose the nature of the activities which have been videotaped. In my example, dancing and digging. 
may not be necessary to disclose that it was the, the, the Charleston that was being danced, may not be necessary to disclose the depth of the hole or the size of the shovel. The real controversy here is how much more has to be divulged. Now, in my paper, I've set out the two rules which have to be balanced and weighed, which are Rule 30.09, which provides that where a party has claimed privilege in respect of a document, the party may not use the document at trial except to impeach the testimony of a witness or with leave of the trial judge. So the corollary of that would seem to be that privileged documents can be used to impeach the testimony of a witness, even if they haven't been disclosed beforehand. And on the other hand, we have Rule 31.06, subsection 1, which provides that a person examined for discovery shall answer any proper question relating to any matter in issue, and no question shall be objected to on the grounds that, A, the information sought is evidence, and Rule 31.06, subsection 3, which provides that a party may, on an examination for discovery, further obtain disclosure of the findings, opinions, and conclusions of an expert if they relate to issues in the action, unless the expert's findings were made solely in contemplation of litigation, and the party being examined undertakes not to call the expert as a witness at trial. Now, I quickly want to refer to the conflicting decisions on, on this point and the, the way that the, the courts have, have attempted to balance and weigh those two sections. First of all, I'd like to refer to the decision of Sacri and Burden which was a decision um, in July of 1986 of the Honorable Judge Borens, who said in answer to the question, is it necessary to give a, a running blow-by-blow -blow detailed account of what's on a videotape? He said, yes, it is. And I'm going to refer to his reasons. He said about the, the, uh, the films, in the present case, the defendant has taken issue with the nature and extent of the plaintiff's injuries. The whole range of informational discovery is governed by Rule 31.06, subsection 1, which constitutes a very broad rule as to its scope. It permits, quote, any proper question relating to any matter in issue in the action. The plaintiff's injuries are a matter in issue in this case. Therefore, any information relating or relevant to the plaintiff's injuries known by the defendant is properly within the scope of informational discovery. Indeed, the paradigm of such information is what the plaintiff was observed to do by a witness undertaking surreptitious surveillance of the plaintiff. Such information is necessary to enable plaintiff's counsel to know the case he has to meet and to avoid surprise at trial. How often we've heard this type of reasoning. That's the type of reasoning which seems to underlie uh, many of the, the broadened discovery provisions in the new rules. He goes on to say, it may also assist plaintiff's counsel in lowering or increasing his expectations of, of the plaintiff's injuries and may promote settlement of her case. It may well be, and I am not deciding this, that the person who conducted this surveillance may himself or herself be examined for discovery in the appropriate circumstances pursuant to Rule 31.1. Accordingly, the defendant is to reattend at her own expense to answer all questions to which objection was taken by her counsel at her examination for discovery. And then he says this, specifically, she must provide information with respect to the dates times, and precise locations of the observations of the plaintiff made by Mr. Brittnell, and everything which Mr. Brittnell observed the plaintiff to do or not to do on each occasion that he saw her. Now, in the uh, case of Nolan and Grant, Mr. Justice Steele didn't go that far. And I'd like to just read from, from that decision. He said the following, the surveillance was made after the action had been commenced for the purpose of the litigation. The film is privileged. Rule 30.09 provides that a privileged document may not be used at trial without leave except to impeach the testimony of a witness. 
Obviously, the film was taken for the very purpose of possibly impeaching the plaintiff's testimony at trial. The film itself cannot be ordered to be produced, nor, does, nor is it asked that it be. This being so, to order the disclosure of every detail in the film would be to obtain indirectly what cannot be obtained directly. Rule 31.06 and Rule 30.09 must both be given meaning. They deal with different matters, and they must be balanced against each other. In the present case, Grant has given all the information with respect to the surveillance that is required by Rule 31.06. To order more would defeat the privilege contemplated by Rule 30.09. Now, after I was asked to speak at this seminar, I was happy to find an unreported case because I thought, good, I can tell you something that you won't be able to, or you won't have already read about. And that case is the decision of Mr. Justice Maloney, which is quoted extensively in my paper. And the reason that the quote is so long is because I thought it, it, it may not have been reported by um, today's date. Mr. Justice Maloney said the following. He refused in uh, a situation similar to the, the uh, example which I've been using here to refuse or to um, compel the production of a, a videotape. And in that case, Mr. Justice Maloney reasoned as follows. It is a tenet of statutory interpretation that all provisions of the statute must, if possible, be given meaning when the statute is read as a whole. To require the defendants to effectively deliver up to the plaintiff the contents of these privileged documents prepared in anticipation of litigation would be to deny meaning to Rule 30.09 and to eradicate traditional concepts of the privilege attached to documents prepared by lawyers in anticipation of litigation. Therefore, I hold that the defendant is required to inform the plaintiff only that such documents, statements, photographs, or films exist, the dates thereof, and the names and addresses of the possible witnesses in relation to them. That's why I wonder um, whether or not, on Mr. Justice Maloney's interpretation, he would say that it was even necessary to say that the film contained um, dancing and digging. He says, it must also be remembered that the purpose of such surveillance is either verification or contradiction. A trial is a search for truth, and surveillance is a tool used in pursuit thereof. A truthful witness will not suffer by having been under surveillance. Prevarication and exaggeration may be exposed. Full disclosure in advance may well enable the untruthful witness to avoid the effect of the surveillance by tailoring his or her evidence to dilute its impact. Indeed, it is the very type of claimant in respect of whom surveillance is indicated that such attempt at deception is likely to occur. On being confronted with such evidence on cross-examination, the witness, of course, has full opportunity to take issue with, explain, or call evidence to rebut it. Although most of the cases cited above dealt with instances in which the existence of the surveillance documents was not disclosed until trial, I see no reason to differentiate between that situation and the present case. In fact, this situation was anticipated in Jones and Heidel, where it was said, quote, there would have been no obligation whatsoever on counsel for the defense to make them available to counsel for the, the plaintiff. Surely, if a defendant who does not reveal the existence of such documents until it is sought to introduce them at trial can be permitted to use them, one who reveals their existence beforehand should not be prejudiced by a requirement that he reveal their contents to the opponent. So the matter is, is still um, not entirely settled. Uh, there seem to be decisions going both ways. If you're acting for um, a defendant, and you want to be able to use a videotape, for example, in order to impeach the credibility of a witness at trial, and only for that reason, um, there would appear to be a very good argument that detailed information about the contents of the videotape in my example need not be divulged. And a strong argument exists that so long as the use of the videotape is confined to the impeachment of credibility, it can be used at trial to impeach credibility without the prior disclosure of its precise details. 
the question that I was asked to address is, is a defendant unduly um, punished by early preparation? And if the interpretation of the law that I have set out in my paper today is correct, then obviously the answer to that question is no. If um, such counsel is prepared to use the surveillance documents only for the purpose of impeachment of credibility, he can probably withhold the documents and use them effectively at the time of the trial. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is John Campion. Um, I have the pleasure of appearing on behalf of my partner, Alan Rock, and I have two topics, but because of the shortness of time, I've been asked to be quite short, so what I will do is simply give an overview of them and uh, refer you to Alan's paper um, on the, or papers on the two topics um, for a fuller di discussion of some of the issues. But let me at the outset, on the understanding that some of you may be more junior than me, um, and ask the indulgence of those of you who are more experienced and, and may have some further understanding, discuss some of what I think is a proper way to approach questions on discovery generally. And it comes from um, a lesson hard learned from Walter Williston, who um, was a man that I had a pleasure, and so did Alan, of working with. And he forced us to always ask one question, which to some of you who are experienced may be obvious, and to others, um, you may not have put it in quite the same way. But the first question that comes to mind when doing a pleading, and in particular in doing a discovery, and that will then deal with who is going to be, who are going to be witnesses, and what undertakings on discovery are all about, is what is the cause of action? And from that single question, which um, while it sounds simple, it has a great deal of complexity, one has to ask the subsidiary points by looking it up both in cases and otherwise as to what are the components of the cause of action in order to then determine what, determine what is relevant in your pleading for material facts, what is relevant on your discovery, and therefore what is relevant to answer by way of undertaking or not, and what is therefore relevant evidence at trial. If you're a plaintiff, it becomes particularly significant because, it, significant because of a motion for non-suit. And so it's within that context, that is, what is the cause of action, what are its elements, and how do you go about proving its various components in order to be successful, that I place my contact, I put my remarks in, in the context dealing with, first of all, undertakings on discovery. And touching upon undertakings, there are several ways in which the courts or the masters have characterized them, as Alan has discussed in his paper. The first, when you actually give an undertaking, the first way of characterizing it is that you are acknowledging that the question put to the witness is a proper one within the context of the kind that I've just spoken about. That being the case, having done so and given your undertaking, you can't then read we look at the issue as to whether sometime later the undertaking can or cannot be answered. It having been given, it's an acknowledgement that the question is a proper one, and as a result, you must answer it. The second and more onerous characteristic of an undertaking is, as Master Donkin has stated in a case called Union Industries and Beckett Packaging Limited, and he has place the undertaking is where we probably most often understand it in its general context as opposed to just on discovery, and that is, is that it's, the form, it's a form of a contract. It's a promise to produce certain information regardless of the propriety of the question. You're not just waiving the propriety of the question, but it becomes an absolute contract that you have made with the other solicitor which will be enforced absent some form of contractual relief which in the case of Union Industries and Beckett, um, the relief was granted on the basis of mutual mistake of fact, 
So it can be taken a very long way in terms of dealing with um, an undertaking and the obligation that you admit to when you um, give such an undertaking um, on an examination for discovery. Dealing lastly um, with undertakings, um, I note what the Professional Conduct Handbook has to say about them, and that is that an undertaking given by a lawyer to the court or to another lawyer in the course of litigation must be strictly and scrupulously carried out. And unless clearly qualified, the lawyer's undertaking is a personal promise and responsibility. With that in mind, that is, the fact that you've got a very serious obligation as regards answering an undertaking from the perspective of the Law Society and complaints that could be made in not answering it, having regard to the fact that it is a, a contract which is enforceable, which you can't resile from just because you made a mistake except in exceptional circumstances, and or it's an acknowledgement that the question asked was a proper one. In all of those circumstances, two things from a practical perspective arise. The first one is, is that you don't give one unless you're absolutely certain that you are willing to do so and that you understand what you're being asked. And probably more importantly, Upon giving an undertaking, you should place it on the record in your own words, having regard to your own understanding, if there is even a shadow of a doubt as to what the undertaking might mean. And this can create an extended transcript on one side, but on the other side, it saves an obvious enormous burden if you've guessed wrong and you've given an undertaking which you didn't mean to or which when read in the cold light of day the other side has said a certain series of words which you understand the, you misunderstood, have admitted to the undertaking and therefore compelled in any event to answer it. I'll then leave undertakings on discovery and deal with witnesses and experts. And again, I will be very short because of the shortness of time and I apologize that I'm out of order. Dealing with witnesses, as you're no doubt aware, Rule 31.06 has compelled parties to disclose the names and addresses of persons who might reasonably be expected to have knowledge of transactions or occurrences in issue in the action. The dispute among or in the cases deals with a number of issues and the first one is whether you're compelled to give the names of witnesses and the addresses of witnesses with respect to, li with respect to both liability and with respect to damages? And the answer is yes, you must. A second issue is whether you must give a summary of what those witnesses are going to say, um, if, having given their names and addresses. And the answer appears to be, although there is a dispute on that, that you do not need to disclose what the witness will say. You only need to disclose the names of the witnesses and the addresses of the witnesses. Third issue is when you have to do it and whether you have to do it on discovery or whether you only have to do it before trial. And it appears that you cannot be discovered on these names and addresses of witnesses, but you can um, withhold that until sometime prior to trial and answer the uh, answer by way of undertaking, having been asked it. A fifth issue deals with um, experts and when you are compelled and when you may not um, disclose experts' um, reports on one side and whether you have to or have to or whether you are relieved from disclosing an expert. Rule 31.06 sub 3 Parts A and B deal with, in very express terms, when you are entitled not to call a witness, and that's dealt with in Allen's paper. But if you do, if you are going to call a, an expert and decide to call him, you must give a full understanding of his findings, opinions, and conclusions. There's no exception to that, and that can, in some circumstances, include the notes upon which an expert relied. Now, those are my very short comments, which I promise to keep to a very few minutes having regard to the lateness of the time. Thank you for your attention, and I'm sorry that I didn't have longer with you. We have a very few minutes for questions. If you identify the panelists to whom you wish to put your question. I have a question. Oh, there's a question. Uh, when do you decide that that is uh, getting in the realm of misconduct? 
Do you mean misconduct on the part of the questioning lawyer who submits several lists? Several lists. Like every time you give an answer, that's not the admission. It's not under the rules. It doesn't seem to be a limit. Like, it's not like you have to There does not appear to be any limit under the rules for the number of lists you can submit. The only um, thing that ties you down is that each list has to be related to questions previously asked. You just can't begin afresh. But ultimately, it's only uh, the court, in the first instance, the master on a motion, who can say, no, this is going too far, and you've got to stop now. But he has the advantage in that situation, in my submission, over an oral discovery, because you can see it all there. There it is. Whereas in the oral discovery, you can't really rule effectively on what's going to happen in the future. That's the difference in my mind. I'd like to ask the, uh, the panelists about uh, cross-examining on discovery. Since the, the new rules have come in, we're allowed to cross-examine. There are some counsel who say you have only one cross-examination of a witness. I'd like to know if any of you have uh, gone to trial on any of your discoveries where you've aggressively cross-examined a witness and whether it has worked a second time or backfired. Uh, so far, I've done it only once, and that involved a pathological liar, so it was easy. All John's opponents are pathological liars. <laughs> no, no, there's no the lawyer wasn't there. The, the um, witness was. And it didn't, as it turns out, it didn't hurt. But I certainly note that um, when I have had the occasion to cross-examine more than once any witness, and I'm sure the experienced lawyers in the, in, the, in the room will know this, the second time around they get a little chippy and very confident, particularly if you're not before a judge. So there's the, there's the confidence building and dealing with the cross-examination I think is a real problem. But I have found that where a, you have an equivocating witness and one that doesn't have a great regard for the truth in a complex case, the cross-examination on discovery is extremely helpful to get the issues, to get them to be um, uh, bound in an early stage in a series of answers that are either contradictory or simply wrong in the face of the other documents, and that you're better to get it the first time than to wait until the second time, because the, I suppose the theory is, is that you prepare more for trial a witness than you do for discovery. So on the whole, I would say that if you if you think you can make a lot of headway and get a person fixed to a lot of positions, then don't worry about the second cross-examination. Get it while you can. Uh, Marianne, I'd like to ask you, uh, what if you, in your preparation for trial, find a document that the plaintiff should have produced? Um, and it's the plaintiff's own document. You, you get it as part of your, your brief and you want to use it at trial, do you have to disclose that? Do you have to amend your affidavit of documents and, and uh, let the cat out of the bag, or can you hold it in your in your briefcase until the uh, critical moment? I think you have to disclose it. Joyce, do you have a, a, a view on that? I, I think you have to disclose it. In fact, I thought you had to disclose the whole darn tape in Marianne's talk. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am not... Uh, uh, big believer in keeping things uh, secret and having subtle uh, strategies. I tend to let it all hang out. Uh, and, and I think in that particular case, you're obliged, you're obliged to a document that comes into your possession. Do you want to tell us your win-loss ratio? <laughs> <laughs> of, of keeping uh, tapes and surveillance secret or what? Are there any other questions from the audience? David? John, in the light of the rulings as to what undertakings are uh, rulings that I disagree with, and it's interesting that in the Daywalk case, which Justice Linden affirmed an appeal for me as to what undertakings were, and then a week later in Valleyfield adopted this business about Cooper V, Fidelius, and all that other stuff. But in light of what the courts have now said undertakings are, why would you give any undertaking on discovery to do anything, as opposed to simply saying, I agree with you, Ms. Harris, it's a proper question, we can't answer it now, and off the record say, you know, I'll answer it. And if you bring a motion tomorrow to compel me to answer it, I'll just tell the master, I agree it's a proper question, we just can't do it. In other words, my question is, why give undertakings? The, the, I suppose it comes from a sense of custom 
and a sense of trying inside the discovery process to give as reasonable a discovery as you can in the circumstances because the pro I get a the, my philosophy is, is the process isn't mine it's my clients and it's the other sides and I'm a, I'm trying to help them through the process but it's not for me to try in any way although I, I recognize your risk to try and give as much information as I can within the spirit of the rule. Doesn't it, doesn't that, isn't that goal achieved by saying, on the record, I agree it's a proper question, we can answer it now? In the tough case, yes. Can in I the, add something? I tried that trick and the motion came up before you, and, <laughs> and I was ordered to go out and get the answer, and they could no, keep renewing the discovery until I did. Ordered to go out and get the answer, Undertaking. There's, there is there is a is difference. No There's no doubt that the question is a proper question. I simply raise the point. If I were counsel today, and I was now faced with what the courts have said undertakings are, I would be a lot more reluctant to give them than I used to be. That doesn't mean to say that I won't be compelled to go and get the answer in being a proper question, but at least it's not an undertaking. That's really the only part of the I agree with the distinction, but as between giving an undertaking and being wrapped on the knuckles by you, I think I'd prefer to give the undertaking. <laughs> you looked at me like I was sleazy. So would I. <laughs> uh, one other point I'd like to make is what Joyce said. This business about being polite and phoning up the other side to try and arrange a mutually convenient discovery. So while your secretaries are negotiating back and forth, which will take weeks, the other side serves you with an appointment, or sometimes what happens even more nervy is where you agree to discover the other side six weeks from now, and the date's already fixed, no appointment, and then he comes back with an appointment returnable before that date. And I've written the judgment which says you can't do that. In other words, we finally got at least one judgment which rewards politeness. And if you initiate attempts to get discovery which have not yet borne fruit, so to speak. You can't subvert that process by serving a formal appointment. You still have the right to We'll give Master Sandler the last uh, word. I'd like to thank the panelists, and we have to be back in the room at 3.10. We're ready to resume, and I hope you are as well. I'd like to introduce our final um, set of speakers, starting at my immediate right, my far right, I should say, is um, the Honorable Mr. Justice Austin. Um, seated to my immediate right is the Honorable Mr. Justice Holland. Uh, regrettably, you do not have a copy of Mr. Justice Holland's curriculum vitae before you, and although I'm sure he is well known to most of you, I'd just like to say a couple of brief things about him. Mr. Justice Holland was appointed to the Supreme Court of Ontario in September of 1972. He is responsible for the administration of the Toronto civil jury and non-jury courts, and he has been responsible for them for the past four years. He is a member of the trial list committee with overall responsibility for the administration of the Court of Ontario and a member of the future of the courts committee responsible for planning for the future of the Supreme Court trial division in Ontario. There is much more that I could say about Mr. Justice Holland but I'll confine my remarks to those brief comments. And um, continuing over to my far left is um, the Honorable Mr. Justice Montgomery. And seated next to Mr. Justice Montgomery is um, Terence O'Sullivan. And last but not least, uh, seated next to Mr. Justice Austin is uh, Melvin Salman. Our first speaker now will be the Honorable Mr. Justice Holland. Would you please welcome him? Thank you. I've been asked to speak to you about the um, drawn and on jury list. We have about 1,700 cases on the list. The way you get a case on the list is to certify a case ready for trial, serve your notice of trial, certificates of readiness, you pass your record, the action goes on the list for trial. That doesn't help you very much because it doesn't move at all when it's on the list for trial until you get a pretrial appointment. If you don't get an appointment for a pretrial, and if you don't waive your pretrial, 
then the case is automatically struck off the list after 12 months. So you're right back to start or go again. Now, if your case is struck off, you won't even be told about it. You'll eventually find out when your client telephones you a couple of years later and says, where's my trial? Where's my case? And you phone up the trial office, and they tell you it was struck off a year before. It's easy enough to get it replaced on the list. All you've got to do is make an appointment with the trial office to come to see me or some other judge who's looking after the list, and it will be restored to the list. That puts you back at the start again. You then either have to waive your pre-trial appointment or arrange an appointment for pre-trial. At the present time, if you waive pre-trial, and it should, can only really be done on consent, you'll be put on the list for an actual trial. That is, you'll be reached for trial in about two months. If you ask for a pre-trial appointment, the waiting period is again about two months. And after your pre-trial has been held, you will be actually reached for trial in about two months. So that we consider that the waiting period for trial in Toronto non-jury is about four months. Now, we don't count July and August because we don't sit there. Um, insofar as pre-trial is concerned, Justice Robert Montgomery is going to speak to you about that. But what we have found is that most, most of the cases, most of the 1,700 cases on the Toronto non-jury list are really not ready for trial, and they're not even ready for pre-trial. When you apply for your pre-trial appointment, you must be sure that your case is ready for pre-trial. If it isn't, the pre-trial judge very likely will strike it off the list and you're right back to start again. The list that is the non-jury and the jury list is spoken to every Thursday morning. The jury list at 9 o'clock in the morning, the non-jury list at 9.15. You are entitled to one adjournment without any good reason for about up to two months. After that, you're forced on for trial unless you have a very good reason. Counsel has broken a leg or your client's broken a leg or something like that. You won't be forced on for trial if you are in another superior court on another trial or on an appeal. Otherwise, you will be forced on. Now, that's about all I have to say about the Toronto non-jury system. We dispose of about 150 cases or just less than that a month. The statistics are really quite extraordinary. In the month of March, for example, we disposed of 138 cases, of which only eight went right through to judgment. That means that all the rest of the cases were either struck off, settled before trial, or settled during the course of the trial. So only a relatively small percentage of the cases actually go through trial. I would estimate that, on the average, about 10%. Now, I'd be delighted to answer any questions that, that you have. Yes. What if you're in a Sheila? <laughs> Two weeks ago, I was 57 on the list. Yes. And I was called by. And you're now 86. No, I was called by Wednesday and replaced by the beginning of the following week. Is that typical? I wish it were. The trouble is that, as you know, we have a circuit system. So our judges have to service, I think, 52 district and or county towns around the province. The sittings are assigned. You have a one-week sitting maybe in Welland and three weeks in Thunder Bay. But somebody gets into a murder trial somewhere, and the sittings have to be extended. You're short that judge, and they habitually steal from Toronto non-jury and Toronto jury. So we don't usually know until about Wednesday of the prior week, how many judges we're going to have for the next week. Some weeks we're very lucky, we have seven or eight, and some weeks we're unlucky, we only have a few. Uh, there's one thing I should say also, and that is that we will give you fixed trial dates in Toronto non-jury if your case meets certain criteria. There are three criteria, any one of which will be sufficient. One, that the trial is 15 trial days or more in length. Two, that you have witnesses from great distances or who have difficulty coming 
For example, you need an exit uh, permit from Iran or something like that. You get a fixed date. Or three, you have a very large number of experts. I had an application this morning where they had, they expected to call 10 doctors as witnesses. Very difficult to get them all organized. I gave them a fixed date. If you need a fixed date, speak to the trial office, and they will give you an appointment to see me. Now, here's one. Small question. If I won't fix a date for you. If you're in a district court trial, and you're also in the Supreme Court listing called the trial, you mentioned Superior Court. How about a district court? Well, if they're competing, the Superior Court will take precedence. That is, if you say, I'm going to be reached next week in the district court, and I'm going to be reached next week in the Supreme Court, I'll say, you better speak to the de district court and get all, because if, I want you to go on. If you're in the midst of a trial. If you're in the midst of a trial, you go ahead and finish it in district court. We won't call you. Yes, Mr. Glass. I'll, I'll ask you to explain the, the example you gave. You start off with being number 14 on the list, one week, and all of a sudden you find you're 57. Well, I hope that that doesn't happen very often. Um, what does happen is that you're number 14 on the list, and then we have three fixed trial dates for the next week, and we only have three judges. So they come in one, two, three, and you're now not suddenly number 17. But generally speaking, you maintain your place on the list and move up. If you get an adjournment, you go to the bottom of the list. So you've got to say you're ready to move up the list. Um, one other thing I should say, the rules make mention of speedy trials and speedy trial lists. You're supposed to maintain a list for speedy trials and the master or another judge can make an order for a speedy trial. We don't maintain a list of speedy trials, but if you can prevail on someone to give you such an order, make an appointment to see me, I will put you right on for trial. If you waive a pre-trial and you see me today, I'll put you on a week from Monday for trial. That's how fast we can be if you get that sort of an order. By the same token, if there's great urgency in trying a case, for example, if your client is dying and has six weeks to live, we'll get the case on for trial. In the alternative, we'll appoint a, a trial judge to hear the evidence of that ill person uh, and then continue the trial later. So we do what we can to convenience you. Yes? I find that uh, the recurring problem probably not in the practice that I've seen. You're listed and you're ready for a pre trial, and in theory you could have it two months from now, but almost invariably the defendants are not ready and have not had any stuff. Well, I don't know that that can be very much done from my point of view, because we leave it up to counsel to ask for a pretrial appointment when they're both ready. And the pretrial judge has general, or they're generally asked, to strike cases off the list if the case is not ready for trial at the time of the pretrial. So it's a, it's a real problem. I suppose it's a problem for the masters, really. There should be an application to strike out a defense or, or for refusal to fix an appointment for dis discovery or, or to complete it, I suppose. I don't know. Any other questions? Yes. How long between requesting a pre-trial appointment and getting one? About two months. We have a backlog of about 300 pre-tried cases right now, which is about two months' worth of pre-trials. Uh, and we've got about a two-month wait. I think you can still get an appointment in June, but most of the appointments are now for the summer or September. We're suggesting the final plaintiff, and I list my case for trial, uh, and I want a pre-trial. Uh, I can get a pre-trial within two months, and assuming no settlement, get on for trial within two months? That's right. You'll be called for trial about two months later, but remember, the other side can ask for an adjournment and will get it for no good reason once, but for up to about two months. 
So you could be kept waiting for about six months if that happens, a total of six months. But the whole secret is to, as soon as your case is on the, is on the ready list, apply for a pretrial. Then the time starts to run. Otherwise, it just sits there and will be struck off in 12 months. Okay, any more questions? Can I get back to my trial now? Thank you very much. I'm uh, to speak very briefly on uh, no frills trials. Uh, my, t my talk is based on a normal trial, not your four month monster. Um, and it's always, uh, the discussion is based on the process, which is the objective is either, either to settle or go to trial. I, uh, I start with a no frills trial should have the same quality of service and hopefully the same result at the least reasonable cost possible. Um, there's four things that I say one should do. Number one, make it simple and keep it simple. Number two, avoid surprises for yourself. Number three, narrow the issues. And number four, look for the worthwhile shortcuts. And with those four things in mind, the points in my paper aim at that. I think to, to have a no frills trial, you have to make it simple. To make it simple, you've really got to take your case, analyze the issues, and hopefully simplify them right away. And uh, that starts before you even do a pleading. And what I do is if you have the kind of client who can walk in and give you a chronological summary and all the documents, Xeroxes in chronological order, and so you can make a, an initial document brief, then you start way ahead of the game and it costs the client very little. You haven't even spent a moment on it yet. So when you get that, you can read it and use that document brief both for your pleading, whether it's a statement of claim or a statement of defense, and to draft, of course, your affidavit of documents to prepare the, the index is usually your basic chronology, the index to the document brief. And of course, that document brief will be your exhibit one on discovery. And after you get the documents from the other side, you put them all together and that document brief will be your exhibit one at trial. And if you can put in documents quickly, you can save days of trial time and save lots of costs. Along with that, of course, you can use rule 51 to get admissions. Now, because it's a process, you should start with dealing with pleadings. If every paragraph of your pleading has one simple fact in a statement of claim, you force the other side under Rule 27 that they have to either admit, deny, or say no knowledge of that fact. That pleading forces them to admit virtually all the facts. If they don't, if they say no knowledge, send a request to admit, and it's simple. Rule 51, attach your pleading. In 20 days, they have to admit the facts. If they don't deal with it, if they don't answer you and they're deemed to be admitted, and if they do answer you and they should have admitted and they didn't, then the costs that were occasioned by that, assuming you have a strong trial judge, will be to your client no matter what the outcome of the trial. The objective being to keep the cost down or to hopefully minimize your cost exposure. Once you uh, are ready for discovery, and that can usually be done fairly simply, there are certain pre-discovery matters you should consider. I've dealt with Rule 51 already. The second is, is there a shortcut by using, for example, a motion under Rule 21? Now, you should never bring motions unless they are going to accomplish some objective that will get you either a settlement or to trial faster. For example, if in your pleadings there's really no facts in dispute and it's just a question of law, Rule 21 can be used to force the other side to deal with a question of law. And if you win the question of law, you don't need a trial. The other way you can deal with Rule 21, it says, and you, can, you can't use other evidence, but if there's a request to admit and the other side admits certain facts, then you can take your case and make it a question of law, if that's what it is, and hopefully solve your case quickly. These are ideas to, to, as shortcuts, and I recommend them highly. There's other things you can do, of course. Certificates of pending litigation or a Rule 45 motion, which is the analogy to a personal property claim, to preserve property may very well force us uh, the opposing side into settling with you reasonably rather than tying up property. Rule 20 motions for summary judgment, unless you have a clear case, I would not recommend them because of the cost consequences and what turns into a mini trial before you even get to trial. Rule 51.06 can be used if you get admissions to bring motions for a judgment. And Rule 6 sometimes is very helpful. If you can stay the proceeding as a defendant, you can stop the costs. Going to discovery, I think that the most important thing in discovery is to try and get as many admissions before discovery so your discovery can be half an hour. 
What you do is you take your Rule 51 with your pleading and your document brief and you send it to the other side. If they force you then to ask questions about all those things that are really unnecessary, the cost consequences are going to be horrendous if you get Mr. Justice Montgomery at the trial. He will make sure that the other side pays every penny for putting you through an unnecessary process. If you take the document brief and the other side's documents, forcing an affidavit of documents within 10 days of the close of pleadings, you put it all together and that's one document brief. You can mark that Exhibit 1 on discovery, as I said, and mark an Exhibit 1 at trial, and that will make the cost of the trial and the discovery much, much less. Don't forget that you can object to questions and let your client answer them. It's an appropriate tool to use to avoid motions, because if you object and they're going to bring a motion and you have to answer the question in the end, if it's not going to hurt you, let your client answer, but put the objection on the record so that at trial, when the, when the issue is raised, you can say to the trial judge, I objected to the question at discovery, I believe this area is not relevant, and you can get a ruling on relevancy, and hopefully if it isn't relevant, keep out a whole section of evidence from the trial, that'll cut down the cost. Don't forget, you can correct answers to your discovery, so even if you refuse some questions and later on you say it is relevant, you can send a correction, and Rule 31.09 and 31 point really allows you to do that and avoids motions as well. To make sure you have no surprises at discovery, you should always ask the following questions, the names and address of witnesses, and a summary of their evidence. And ask the question for each paragraph, is that all the facts you rely upon? Is that all the evidence you rely upon? Are there any witnesses you rely upon with regard to those facts? So that you have no surprise when you walk into trial. And those should be basic questions on discovery. It's surprising how many, how many counsel don't ask them, and they go to a trial with a whole bunch of witnesses they think they need when they don't know everything that the other side plans to do. I'm not going to deal with pretrial conferences because Mr. Justin Montgomery is, but the power of a pretrial judge to make orders can save you time and money because it's virtually the same as bringing a motion. If you bring a motion to a pretrial judge asking for certain relief, most pretrial judges will deal with it, whether to split the issues of liability and damages, to force undertakings, to force answers to questions, to, to force admissions of facts, to force admissions of documents. At the pretrial, you can force, in effect, to get an order that will shorten your trial and, and cost you very little. The other thing that I recommend is going to lunch with counsel, even after the pretrial or before the pretrial. If you go to lunch with counsel, you can sit and discuss the case, and often you can settle the case, and I've done that a number of times, and you can save yourself hours of your life. Trial preparation. Going, going to the basics. In trial preparation, you can take what I believe is a factual chronology from your index. You take your discoveries and add the facts you've learned from discovery, put in the page references in one column for the page references of the documents, page references discovery in another column, both for plaintiff and defendant, and then in another column, you should put down where there are facts that have to be proved and the witnesses who can prove them. And that document, which is your factual chronology, is your basic document for proving your case at trial and for doing your examinations in chief and your cross-examination. Going back to your simple themes, if you have simple themes, you can say to yourself in preparing your direct examination, what do I have to prove in my cause of action, relating it to your theme. And I'll give you an example in a moment so I can put it into context. In cross-examination, ask yourself, what do I want to say at the end of the trial about that witness? And when you say, here's what I want to say about that witness, that will be your cross-examination. And when using those kind of techniques, you can usually speed up what I believe would be a, a trial process by ensuring that you keep it simple and to the, to the themes that you have. Don't be afraid to give your chronology with the bare bones to the trial judge. They find it very helpful, along with the document brief. Obviously, you prepare your summonses to witness your notice to produce under the Evidence Act, under Section 35 and 36 and 55, and your notices under, with regard to expert reports, 10 days before trial. Those should be basic documents that you have in your computer or on, on mag cards, so that you can have those documents served with the witness letter right away, and that'll save you time as well. I think that uh, in, in dealing with the simple theme, I have found that in dealing with clients, if you try and go through a morass of detail without giving them a theme, it's usually difficult for most ordinary people and most ordinary lawyers and most ordinary judges. But if you keep it simple, it makes it easy. One case I had, the uh, client was the person who found missing property. And he found that a certain company in Montreal was entitled to a million dollars worth of lack shares. The persons who owned the shares didn't know it. They hadn't claimed it for 50 years. He went to Montreal and got and entered into a contract with the person. And the key to the trial was when we sued for the money when they didn't want to pay, they said that there was mutual mistake and frustration and all sorts of things. The contract was a simple contract. 
My client provided information, they provided cooperation, they shared the expenses, and they would share the profit. What the person didn't know was that the thing that they were sharing was the share certificates that were in the filing cabinet of the person who owned the million dollars worth of shares. That simple theme, providing information for cooperation, sharing expenses, and share the profit, that conceptualization of the contract was easy for the client to understand. He could relate every document to that theme. He could relate all the issues of mistake or frustration or misrepresentation to the theme because once the theme was sold, everything in effect fit into the theme. There was no misrepresentation if that was the deal. So once you have a theme, it's easy to, if you like, put forward your case. One thing I find in trial preparation is you should do your closing argument first. If you do your closing argument, you know exactly where you're going. Once you know where you're going, it is very easy to plan your examinations. I think that uh, with regard to one area that I find helpful, if the other side refuses to answer questions or doesn't answer undertakings, you have two choices. You can bring motions which will cause expense, or you can use the rules. The rules provide under Rule 30.08, and 31.09 and 31.07, that if the person doesn't answer undertakings or doesn't respond to questions, then those areas are not allowed to be gone into a trial without leave of the trial judge. And if you as a defendant can force the plaintiff to be unable to go into certain areas, you may put him off his case. Or as a plaintiff, when the defendant refuses certain areas, when they try and bring in evidence to try and deal with one of your claims, you can stop them from dealing with that evidence or putting in documents because of their refusal or failure to give undertakings. So consider not bringing motions and going right to trial and taking the position that they have to get leave and if they do get leave, they'd have to pay all your costs of preparation, all the costs of trial, if they are lucky to get leave, which they probably won't be. Um, otherwise, I uh, wish you a lot of luck in uh, having no frills trials. It's not easy, but if you are organized and keep it simple, it's possible. Thank you. The reason you don't have a paper from me in the uh, in the material is that I wanted you all to be here today to hear this, but you'll get it. My text for this afternoon is uh, from Ecclesiastes, and there is no new thing under the sun. That was true when it was written, and it's equally true today. Uh, nothing that I have to say is new or different. Everything that I have to say on the subject of written advocacy uh, could fit equally well under the heading common sense. What do I mean by that? I mean that everything you commit to print, which might end up in the hands of the other side or of the judge, everything provides an opportunity for advocacy, an opportunity for you to sell your client's case. I propose to deal only with the trial end of it, but remember that the basic rules are the same, whether your, what you write ends up in your opponent's hands or the trial judge's hands. The record, your first opportunity to exercise your powers of persuasion at trial is in the record. Normally it is the first thing the trial judge reads, usually it is the only thing he reads before the trial actually begins. What's in the record, of course, is your pleading, your statement of claim, or your statement of defense. Illustration. The defendant, the plaintiff by way of counterclaim, alleges, and the fact is, that at all material times, the plaintiff, the defendant by way of counterclaim, represented to the defendant, the plaintiff by way of counterclaim, and to the public at large, that a customer of the plaintiff, the defendant by way of counterclaim, could rely on a bank, and in fact, the bank advertised publicly, you can count on the commerce. Now, I picked that example because it's easier to illustrate what I want to say by telling you what not to do. <clears throat> and this isn't a, a wild exaggeration dreamt up by me on a bad night. <clears throat> I took it from a case on which I sat. It involved a claim by a bank against a lawyer 
on his account and a counterclaim by the lawyer, the exact nature of which I was never really able to determine. <laughs> now, I've only been on the bench just over a year, but that was the best example I saw of what not to do, and it illustrates perfectly what lawyers do. I got another one yesterday, and uh, I apologize. It comes from the, it doesn't come from a pleading, it comes from the Canadian Bar Review. Where else? A re-examination of these problematic situations will provide the groundwork for a reconceptualization of the basis for compensation. Again, an example uh, of the way lawyers talk. Your function is to communicate, to convey facts, pictures, ideas, concepts. And this is best done by using simple words or phrases. Plaintiff by counterclaim, for instance, is not a simple phrase. If his name is Smith, call him Smith. I can remember that. Even I can remember that. If you're going to use phrases such as plaintiff by counterclaim, I'm going to be lost halfway through a paragraph like the one I just read. And if I'm lost, you're lost. You're lost in two respects. First, you're no longer persuading me. And second, I'm angry at myself for getting lost, and there's at least a possibility I'll take it out on you. <laughs> the phrase and phrases like plaintiff by counterclaim should be used perhaps once in the body of a pleading, and only then if absolutely necessary. After that, switch to a name that identifies a party in a manner that is meaningful, in a manner that identifies him. Call him, him or her, Smith, the bank, the landlord, the insurer, the tenant, the pedestrian, the victim. <laughs> Use a name that identifies. And if you've got a case where there's uh, black and white and green and brown and gray, don't use the colors. Use something else. Use a name that identifies the party. In most cases, they have such, there are such names. Use short words. Just because you're a lawyer doesn't mean you have to be a, have to talk like a walking dictionary. Short words are easier to hear and easier to understand. Use short sentences. Long sentences are fine if you are the writer. Short sentences are better if you're the reader. Develop your story logically. That usually means chronologically. The goal is communication the passing of facts and ideas from one person to another. Our minds are trained to receive information in a logical fashion. We don't have to. You can throw it all in on a pot, and most minds will sort it out. But logically, and usually chronologically, is the easiest way for us to do it, for us to sort out things. And that's the route you should adopt because it's the easiest way. Now. I admit these principles are difficult to apply to pleadings, and the new rules make it more so. In my view, with due apologies to the authors of the new rules, there is no logic whatever in putting the claim for relief at the beginning of a statement of claim. However, that's what the rules seem to require, and as a plaintiff, once you've done that, in my view, you have a real opportunity to sell your story by drafting a clear and compelling account of the facts. Use that opportunity. Given the choice between a brief, dull account and one slightly longer, which is more interesting, choose the latter. Judges read hundreds of statements of claim. Not many are very interesting. If you could make yours interesting, you've taken the first step towards persuading the judge of the virtue of your cause. So saying it is not easy. I'm saying just the opposite is very difficult, but it can be done, and it does pay dividends. It's more difficult to draft a persuasive statement of defense. This is uh, two reasons are obvious. Number one, you come second. And number two, the rules require you to begin with a recital of the parts of the claim you admit, the parts of the claim you deny, and the parts of the claim about which you have no knowledge. But again, having complied with the rules, 
it's, in my view, still advantageous in most cases to go back to square one and tell the whole story from the perspective of your client, the defendant. It may make the pleading a little bit longer, but it gets your version of the facts into the judge's head. And in my view, it's very important to do that as early as possible. Keep in mind that as a defendant, the judge may not hear your side of the case for days or even weeks. So while he's sitting in his chambers, reading the record, he reads the statement of claim and the statement of defense. You have a golden opportunity to sell right then and there. Use it. Now, what other opportunities are there for written advocacy at trial? And the answer is not many, short of, uh, short of written argument, which I always thought of as a death sentence. I won't deal with document briefs. They're self-explanatory. And in my view, except for the rarest of cases, uh, they're a must put together a document brief. But what are the other items? Number one, chronologies. You're familiar with the facts. The judge isn't. If they are at all complicated, prepare a chronology and offer it as an aid at the earliest possible moment. Show it to the other side first. If they don't object, fine. If they do, unless you think there is some real basis for the objection, tender it anyway, indicating your opponent's objection, and let him explain why it isn't a proper aid. You may find that your chronology becomes the backbone of the reasons for judgment. An agreed statement of facts. There are literally dozens of reasons for using that technique. Uh, Mr. Justice Montgomery may speak on it. Uh, an easy example, if your client is particularly unattractive or unbelievable or has a tendency to self-destroy in the witness box, Consider attempting to persuade your opponent to proceed by way of an agreed statement of facts. You know, if your client is, as between the, the two witnesses, one on either side, if yours is the, the less credible of the two, an agreed statement of facts uh, becomes an attractive proposition. It doesn't have to cover all of the facts, just the area that your unfortunate witness is needed to cover. But there are literally dozens of reasons for using an agreed statement of facts. You know, there's no need for a full dress trial with witnesses coming from halfway around the globe if you can accomplish the same thing by way of an agreed statement of facts. And a good way to lead into it is to suggest it at the pre-trial. Don't, don't have necessarily throw it out uh, as a forceful argument. You can sort of drag it across the end of the council table and see if anybody snaps at it. It's, it's very attractive from a judge's perspective because it shortens the trial time. It also saves him making notes and it saves him having to make findings of fact. So it's a very attractive thing from his point of view. The rules for an agreed statement of fact are the same as for any other document the court will see. Here, however, you're limited by whatever your objective is in doing it. And also by the fact that your opposition must agree as well. But the basic principles remain the same. Simple words, short sentences, logical sequence. Another item, list of exhibits or lists of exhibits. This sounds elementary and obvious, and it's both of those, but very few counsel even consider it. Most judges do what I do. They keep a list of the exhibits in their bench book. And it will be at the beginning of the notes I make for that particular trial. It's inconvenient to a degree to flip back and forth from my notes to the list, but it's certainly better than no list. The registrar or the clerk usually keeps a list as well and gives the judge an up-to-date copy every morning. So it's out of date as soon as the next uh, exhibit is filed. In any event, his description of the documents the exhibits is not usually very helpful. What is much more helpful is a list that has exhibit numbers, dates, and an accurate description. 
even better if, in addition, you can provide a list of documents in chronological order, again with exhibit numbers. Now this takes thought and preparation, but again you'd be amazed at the help it provides and the frequency with which such a chronological list becomes the skeleton upon which the trial judge puts the flesh of a judgment. These are all very simple, all very elementary. They take time and they take thought and they take preparation, but they're, they're tremendous helps. Memoranda of law. Now these used to be, a, happened in every case. They used to be handed up during argument. Uh, they are rarely used now, although I received one about two weeks ago. I almost fell off the off my chair, I was so surprised it was the first intelligent step either counsel had taken during the trial. Um, I expect one of the reasons for the, for the decline and fall of, of the memorandum of law uh, is the uh, ubiquitous and iniquitous photostat. Uh, people now don't read law, they photostat it instead. Uh, but I, and I expect most judges, would far rather have a two-page memo of law that 150 pounds of photostatted law reports. Why? Because I want to decide this case right now. You may think it's the most significant legal issue since Donahue and Stevenson. You think I should reserve judgment and spend my summer reading law instead of holding down the side of a sailboat. You may be right. I may reserve and I may spend some considerable time reading law but I don't want to. I don't want to reserve, and I don't want to read law. I would like to be able to dispose of this case the instant the last counsel sits down. And if you can help me do that, then I think you're doing your job as an advocate. Because in the process, your job gets done, and so does mine. And one of the ways to accomplish that is to read the law, digest it, and present it in the form of a memo which takes the law and applies it to the facts of the case being tried and leads to the desired result. And if you can give me such a memo, why shouldn't I use it? As a lawyer, when I was doing personal injury work, it seemed to me to be advantageous to fill my opponent's file with my medical reports. I think the same is applicable to memos of law. And the more they are done in simple, clear, straightforward fashion, the more persuasive they will be. Another suggestion, outlines of argument. In all but the simplest of cases, it is very helpful to the judge to hand up, not later than the opening of your argument, an outline of where you're going. It does two valuable things. First, it saves him or her from writing notes and second, and far more important, it provides him or her with a road map as to where you expect to go. And stand back for a minute and look at it. You're familiar with the case. You have lived with it for years, possibly decades. You know the areas of law that have to be covered. If it's an area uh, with which the judge is familiar, he too may know what has to be covered. It's possible he is not, and you have no idea what a comfort it is to have that road map in advance. Lastly, written argument. Um, as I indicated earlier, as a lawyer, I regarded the request for written argument as equivalent to the death sentence. Uh, I don't know anybody who likes it. Judge doesn't want it, you don't want it, the other side doesn't want it, but it happens. Uh, it invariably means delay. To the lawyer, it means a meticulous review and analysis of the facts and an equally careful and usually exhausting study of the law. The net result is to stretch out the trial and to increase the cost to your client. About the memo of law, I only want to say two things. The first is don't deal with all of the facts. Don't start with Adam and Eve and work all the way through. Deal with the facts that are in issue. 
deal with those that are necessary to deal with the issues before the court, but deal with them fairly. Pretend you are writing the findings of fact of the judge. That's how fairly you have to deal with them. Insofar as the law is concerned, what you need to know is that a judge wants quality, not quantity. If there's one decision of the Supreme Court of Canada which is dead on point, give it. It binds the court. It doesn't need any more. In particular, don't give the court ten decisions from American courts which are interesting, but only in some peripheral manner. They may be interesting to you. I won't guarantee that they're interesting to the court. Remember what that person up there has to do. He or she has to make a decision and has to express it either orally or in writing. That decision must deal with the facts and it must deal with the law. If you can set out the facts in a clear, concise, chronological manner that is absolutely fair, then you're doing the judge's job for him. If you can do the same with respect to the law, again, you are doing the judge's job for him. And if you can do both of those things and have your client win, you're doing both your job and the judge's. And in my view, that's the objective of advocacy. Thank you. My name is Terry O'Sullivan, and I've been asked to speak to you this afternoon on what is called the law of distributive costs. I'm not going to tell you to take anyone to lunch, but I hope that you may learn something that will allow your client to take you to lunch when your trial's over. The distributive costs in the context of this discussion means the process or the principle by which a trial judge or adjudicator will award costs to the litigants in proportion to the success that they have enjoyed during the proceedings. <clears throat> we have all heard the phrase, the costs shall follow the event. I don't know how many of us have taken the time to try to understand what the event is or what it means. The uh, and in the few moments that I have today, I'd like to deal briefly with the history of the principle of distributive costs and why I think it's alive and well in Ontario today and give you an example of a case uh, with which I was involved where it was recently applied. <clears throat> Central to an understanding of the principle is the distinction between the event and an issue which has an impact upon the event. The principle has its history in the old English rule, which was a jury uh, trial practice, which stipulated that <clears throat> absent the exercise of discretion by the judge, costs should follow the event. In uh, Pre -20th, just pre-20th century England and just into the 20th century, various English courts undertook an analysis of what that meant and in particular whether it meant that a trial judge was obliged to award costs of the entire trial to the party who had been successful in obtaining judgment notwithstanding that several causes of action or several issues may have been litigated upon which the plaintiff had not been successful. Uh, a variety of authorities determined the following. One, that, that was not the case, that even though you were successful as a plaintiff in obtaining judgment, you were not thereby automatically entitled either in a jury or a non-jury trial to all the costs of that proceeding. Two, 
that <clears throat> if you had been, as a defendant, successful upon several issues or an issue within the meaning uh, of that term, which I will come to, then you as a defendant should have the costs of that issue and they should be set off against the costs of the plaintiff. Now, several problems are, arise out of that, one of which is how you decide what an issue is within the meaning of, the t of that term as it's used in the cases, and second, what do you do with costs that are not easily ascribed to a particular issue? Uh, in the Reed Hewitt case, which is in the materials uh, under, I think, index P, uh, the Lord Chancellor indicated that the costs shall follow the event means that costs are to be distributed according to the results of the several issues, while the party who is successful on the whole gets the general costs. He goes on to define issue as being that which has a direct and definite event in defeating the claim to judgment, in whole or in part. I use that term issue in connection with what I call the but-for test. If I am a defendant and I succeed on an issue and I am able to say to the trial judge, but for my success on that issue, the plaintiff would have been entitled to judgment against me, then I believe that is an issue within the meaning of the proviso, and if I persuade the court to apply this principle, I am entitled to my costs of that issue. The event which I would equate to result in our rules of practice, and in particular Rule 57, is in effect who gets judgment for 60 or 70 years now, the English courts have recognized that an event may itself be the sum result of the disposition of several issues. And those issues may or may not comprise entire and separate causes of action. And if you think of an issue in the but-for way, I think you will have a ready analytic tool to try to put your argument to the court that even though judgment has gone against you, you should have a portion of the costs awarded in favor of your client. And that doesn't mean that only that the plaintiff should not succeed on that issue, but positively that you should have the costs of that issue. <clears throat> This, of course, implies, and I think properly, a rejection of the notion that if a plaintiff is successful in any of the various claims or causes of action which it has advanced, then it should get the entire cost of the proceedings. Now, the use of this principle in Ontario, uh, while not as frequent of late as earlier, has, goes back really to the late 20s and early 30s, and it's not surprising because until the Courts of Justice Act in 1984, the Ontario uh, judicature legislation, the statutory framework under which we conducted our proceedings, was in very large measure derived uh, from the English legislation. <clears throat> the generally thought to be the leading case on the principle of distributive costs in Ontario, a decision of Mr. Justice Hogue in 1939, in which he reviews certain of the English authorities, pronounces them to be the law of Ontario, and in a trial that was before him involving allegations by the plaintiff that the defendant's smelter was uh, spoiling and fouling the properties uh, in the neighborhood and diminishing their property values, he found for the plaintiff on one of the several issues advanced against the plaintiff on the balance of the issues and awarded costs on the basis of that relative success. In so doing, he relied 
very heavily on the English authorities which are to which reference is made in the paper. Now, the uh, third aspect of the law of distributive costs that's historically been developed is dealing with what are called in the cases the general costs. The general costs uh, as a term uh, developed in England, again, in the practice of uh, jury trials. And while we have nothing uh, in our case law or in our jurisprudence which uh, identifies that term or relates it to a specific uh, experience in Ontario, it is generally treated as being those costs which don't relate to a specific issue. So in a situation where a plaintiff has succeeded on certain issues, failed on others, and uh, has judgment in the result or in the event, then a proper order applying the principle of distributive costs would be to award the plaintiff the costs of the action except the, its costs on the issues on which it failed. And to be set off against those costs would be the cost of the defendant upon the issues uh, upon which it had success. So that you get, in effect, all the plaintiff's costs on the one side, out of which are taken the costs of the issues uh, on which it failed, and out of which also are taken the costs of the defendant on the issues in which it succeeded. Now, you can see that this can have a very significant and dramatic effect on who pays who what at the end of the day on the question of costs. <clears throat> in my view, the uh, present rules of practice uh, and the Courts of Justice Act not only authorize, they specifically contemplate the continuation of this process. Uh, of course, Section 40, 141 of the Courts of Justice Act gives a very broad discretion to the court in the uh, awarding of costs. And that discretion is uh, amplified in Rule 57. And if I might read you one particular subsection, <coughs> It says, this is fifth, rule 57.014, and I didn't number these, so you can't blame me. It says, nothing in this rule, or rules 57.02 to 57.07, affects the authority of the court under section 141, A, to award or refuse costs in respect of a particular issue or part of a proceeding. Now, in the uh, recent case with which I was involved, that, invo that uh, also involved the application of this proceedings, uh, it was a case arising out of a railway fire which burned down a warehouse uh, in Oakville. The various bailors had goods stored in that building. Uh, Seventeen of them commenced actions against the railway, which it in turn commenced third party proceedings against the owners and the warehousemen. The owner and the warehousemen themselves commenced plaintiff proceedings, so we had a total of 19 actions. The matter was aggressively and uh, competently pre tried by Mr. Justice Montgomery, but not settled. But not settled. And after 105 days of trial, we uh, think we all should have taken his advice. Uh, but at the end of 105 days of trial and a 275 page judgment for Mr. Justice Hughes, we came to address the question of costs. And threshold question to be addressed was whether, one, the law of Ontario presently allowed the principal distributive costs to be applied, two, whether his lordship was of the view that this was an appropriate case to apply that principle. His lordship specifically found uh, that the law of Ontario did contemplate uh, the court being entitled to apply the principle of distributive costs, and he felt this was an appropriate case to do so. <clears throat> His lordship uh, 
then went on to deal with the thorny problem of identifying the issues, and they're set out in the material, I won't go through them. He identified the issues. He adopted the test in the English proceedings, which was an, the sort of but-for test, that is, if the plaintiff had succeeded on this issue, would it have, in the absence of any other factors, been entitled to judgment against the defendant? He then assigned success or failure to the plaintiff on those issues. And in the result, gave costs to the railway. It <clears throat> deprived the railway of cost on the issues on which he said it had not succeeded and awarded costs uh, to the defendants on the issues upon which he said they had succeeded. And the importance of this to the, litigate, the litigants in the proceedings was that the theory upon which the plaintiff had succeeded, a contractual indemnity theory involving an industrial siding agreement, occupied by most accounts something of between 5 and 7 percent of the evidence and about two or three days of two weeks of argument. And the issues upon which the plaintiff had not succeeded occupied conservatively 55 to 60 percent of the proceedings, and perhaps more. So in the result, uh, the defendants may not only not have to pay costs to the plaintiff in respect to this 105-day proceeding, they may, although the costs have not been assessed as yet and the case is under appeal, uh, they may, in fact, be ahead money. Now, there are, in my submission, very good reasons why this principle should be uh, applied by courts and urged upon courts by counsel. Our present rules allow for joinder of various uh, types of action, quite disparate types of actions. Uh, the discovery process, in my view, encourages try-on claims. And many a meritorious case is cluttered by the addition of two or three causes of action which are not themselves worthy of trial. And if the bar gets the message from the bench or from opposing counsel, that the price for this, for, for bringing unmeritorious causes of action forward with good claims, will be to deprive them of, not only to deprive them of their costs in respect thereof, but to award costs against them in respect of those unmeritorious claims, not only at trial but throughout the proceedings. I think it could do much to ensure that only uh, the bones of the meritorious part of the case actually get to trial and indeed actually get advanced as a cause of action. The uh, case is called, uh, it's reported in two ways. It's reported as RMAC versus the CNR. It's also reported as Oakville Storage and Forwarders Limited. The cost portion of the judgment, it's the cost and prejudgment interest portion of the judgment is I think is or just about to be reported in Carswell's practice cases. No one has yet uh, of the reports has undertaken the task of analyzing 275 pages of the actual judgment for a report, although I'm told that will be done. Uh, it is, I think, a useful tool for all of us to ensure that equity is done as much in the issue of costs as it is in judgment. And I urge you all to consider whether you might use it to your advantage and to your client's advantage. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'll try and be brief. I know that uh, you've been sitting and listen, listening patiently to the excellent speakers who preceded me. What I have to say to you about uh, pre-trial will probably be a bit disjointed and perhaps a little bit old hat. I haven't got a paper before you. I may get one for you. Um, but there's nothing that I have to say that is original. It's all purloined, largely from my brother Griffiths J.A. and Holland J. 
who have done papers on the subject before, I found nothing original to add to what they had said on previous occasions. I think that all one can do is put their own gloss on the particular approach that they prefer to use for pretrial. The pretrial conference system has been in vogue in Ontario since 1975. It uh, predates that by almost 40 years in the United States. Now what we used to do when I was early in practice is complete the examinations for discovery, go for coffee, and settle the case. And then you'd report to your company your recommendation of settlement, and your opponent was going to recommend that to his or her client, and you wrote one report to your client, and hopefully got the case settled. I learned one thing from the late uh, Tommy Phelan, who was the dean of the negligence bar in this province, and it's very apt to the pretrial system. Tommy always said, you couldn't make money with groceries on the shelf, and you can't make money with loss lawsuits stocked or stacked in the filing cabinets. You've got to get them to pretrial or discussion with opposing counsel and get them settled or tried. Then you get paid. So that the, the thrust, at least in Ontario, of pretrial is to try and get cases settled. It's different in the other provinces. In the Maritimes, they don't have enough cases to try, and uh, they're not anxious to, to get them settled at a pretrial at all. In uh, British Columbia, they pre-try them. They do a mini-trial. We, uh, we haven't attempted that system yet. We may someday. Uh, that seems to work for them. They have a bigger caseload than the Maritimes, but nothing like we have in Ontario. We simply could not survive without the settlement ratio we get from pretrials. I would venture to say that most pretrial judges get about an 80% settlement ratio on their pretrials. And as Justice Holland said earlier, uh, an assessment of Toronto non-jury showed a couple of months ago that we were looking at 10 or 12 percent of the cases that came on that Toronto non-jury list that eventually went to verdict. The rest of them were disposed of by settlement or struck off. So that pretrial does work. The, the rule for pretrial conference is Rule 50. It provides that all cases in Toronto are to be pretrialed. Outside Toronto, we try to make pretrials as accessible as we can, and they're as accessible as counsel want them to be. If you don't ask, you don't get. And we try to service them as fast and competently as we can by having large cases referred to Toronto to be uh, pre-tried by a cadre of pretrial judges here, before court, after court, instead of breakfast, you name it. We'll, we'll try it, or pre-try it. Now, in addition to settling cases, Pre-trials simplify the issues. They make counsel become aware of the issues in their case. They may bring the case into focus for the first time for each counsel. And they result in better advocacy when the case is tried. I don't think there is any doubt about that. Certain issues may be resolved. Liability may be agreed upon. 
damages may be agreed upon are part of it. Some parties may be let out of the action with a cost saving to your client. It's important for the pretrial judge to determine at the outset whether the case is ready or not ready and how long it'll take. And that is all a pretrial judge is entitled uh, to endorse on the record unless there are agreements that counsel make that can also be endorsed on the record. If the case is not ready, it will probably be struck off by the pretrial judge and then you'll go to the, to the bottom of the heap. And that's a long climb up in, in Toronto. The pretrial judge may, as Mr. Solomon said, dispose of preliminary motions. He has a broad compass under the rule to get rid of all kinds of issues that are going to take time. And they can uh, be cut right to the bone at pretrial without uh, the niceties of listening to lengthy argument and a lot of um, evidence with fairness to both sides but expeditiously. <coughs> and counsel may also um, admit documents, admit uh, exhibits, may uh, agree on the um, exhibits to be placed before the pretrial judge, not only as the exhibit in the case, but a copy for the judge to mark up as the evidence is going in so that he can listen to the evidence instead of constantly writing down everything that's said and trying to digest it at the same time. It's part of what uh, both Mr. Solomon and Mr. Justice Austin said. It's good written advocacy to do that and impresses the, the trier and you get off to a good start. You're clear upon the fact that the pretrial pre judge may not make disclosure to whoever the trial judge may be. The important thing for the pretrial judge, in my mind, is his objectivity. And if the client knows that the pretrial judge has no ax to grind, he's not going to try the case, probably doesn't know the parties, and he can objectively and dispassionately indicate to counsel what he thinks the probable result in the case will be and may and should, in my view, make recommendations to counsel as to a disposition of the matter, then you can go to your client and advise the client that it's the, the view of only one judge, but perhaps may be representative of current judicial opinion, and you may either narrow the issue, issues or affect settlement. Now, in a complicated case, someone should take notes and that usually falls to one of the junior counsel involved on the case. And then counsel may agree to what has been dealt with and agreed upon by counsel. You can take out those parts that make disclosures that are not agreed upon, and then you can further shorten the trial. Candor is very important on pretrial. You don't have to take a posture on pretrial. Yesterday I had uh, experienced senior counsel on a $7 million fire loss. And both of them 
but the three of them put their positions fairly and objectively and admitted the weaknesses and the strengths of their own cases. Now that case will probably um, go to the Court of Appeal and split two to one if it is tried because there are difficult factual and legal issues involved. But they may be able to settle it on a pragmatic basis. This morning, um, I had a request from Justice Holland to do a free trial or to take a trial. And I've got a whole bunch of free trials booked this week on matters involving out-of-town counsel on malpractice and, and many other types of cases. And there was a five-day trial to go, and uh, the trial coordinator said, will you start it? And the next available date, and I wasn't going to finish by Thursday with these interruptions, that I have available is the 15th of November. So I said to counsel, you're here, you have your witnesses here, I know it's very inconvenient to go away, we don't have another judge this week for you. The only thing I can do to help you is take the time I have available this morning and the time that I have available between 11 and 3 tomorrow and some time I have on Thursday. I'll work with you and see if we can hammer something out. So we went through the usual parameters of a, of a pretrial and counsel were, I had six counsel. It was a commercial real estate transaction, a heavy one. And eventually counsel got to the point that they said, you know, it's not customary to have the clients involved, but if you'd speak to them, it might help. I don't like doing that, but on rare occasion, I'm prepared to do it. To me, the integrity of the pretrial system is more important than any single case. And I'm very loath to deal with clients where it might backfire and have the effect of making even one client feel that he or she was put upon and induced to settle. But I did agree to see the clients. There were too many of them to see uh, in even a jury room. So I went into the courtroom, I wasn't gowned, and I sat at uh, the clerk's table and I briefly outlined to the clients how long I thought the case would take, what I thought the costs would amount to, what a bullock order was, how the costs might impact on any individual litigant, how long I thought the appeal would take. And I said, I really thought that it was an excellent case for settlement and they should listen carefully to their lawyers. Uh, I would then retire and uh, after they talked to their lawyers, I'd be available to see the, the lawyers. The clients were very perceptive and uh, the lawyers came back in and they said, uh, something wonderful has happened. Um, we'd like you to go to lunch early and uh, the clients are taking one another to lunch and we're excluded. And the clients came back this afternoon and had the case settled. So there are different ways of doing it depending on the exigencies of the individual case. I think it was Alan Lentzner who came to me on one pre-trial that we had, a very long one, uh, and General Motors were involved in it. There was an awful lot of money involved. And the second day of the pre-trial, he came with other counsel and said, I would like to bring uh, A, B, C, D, E, and so on from General Motors to sit as observers on the second phase of the pre-trial. And I said, yes, if other counsel don't object, you know the rule, they don't interrupt, they don't say anything. Again, I tell you, this is a rarity, but sometimes it works. Um, the big problem was trying to get, it is often for counsel to get 
the nuances of a pretrial back to the client. In that case, we had everybody um, right through top management in Canada with the company present, and some of the very top people from the United States. And when we concluded three days of pretrial, the only person who uh, the, the team from GM had to speak to was the president for the United States. And the case got settled. And it would have been a very lengthy and expensive trial for everybody. A word about a pretrial memoranda. There's a practice directive of the Chief Justice indicating that in personal injury cases, you should synopsize your medical reports. That's most helpful to the pretrial judge who's doing pretrials for a whole week and has, by the time he comes to your brief, read quite easily 75 to 100 uh, medical reports. And uh, his eyes are starting to blur. And it's a help if he's got a synopsis of the bottom line in your reports. I like this uh, pretrial conference memorandum. I don't think McCarthy's would mind having the idea passed along. They have their form with pretrial conference memorandum right across the front of it. And you're not scurrying around looking to see what the document is. It tells you what it is right there. And you can put your firm name on it or the name of counsel too so that it stands out. All these little aid memoirs are are tools of advocacy which help persuade the trier. I commend that to you. It's short, it's brief, it deals with a motor vehicle accident that then became compounded by alleged medical malpractice in the treatment. And yet the uh, defense theory is articulated in a page and a half. That's most helpful to the trier, uh, the pretrial. If you have a complicated pretrial and you need more time, the pretrial judge will give you more time, particularly if it looks like it will shorten or eliminate a long trial. If it's an injury case or a fatality, make sure you have your actuarial data that you have given copies of it to your opponent and you try to do it on a basis of no surprises at the pretrial. And the whole thing is open and uh, available for everybody to digest before the pretrial and then there is a better chance of a successful pretrial and a probable settlement. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. Yeah. No, I think it's sufficient if you set out your own position. You'll have an opportunity to deal with the uh, defendant's position before the pretrial judge, but I think if you set out on the form uh, the theory of your own case and leave it, uh, and then just uh, say um, defendant's theory as per defendant's memorandum, and then you won't be accused of not properly putting this case. Well, I hope so. And if I'm the pretrial judge, it'll be read. This is the tough part about pretrials. 
one, you have a tremendous amount of material to read. And two, if you're going to be an effective pretrial judge, you can't adopt a laissez-faire attitude. You can't sit back and, and just let it happen, because it won't. You have to pour yourself into the situation much more than you do at a trial. At a trial, you can sit back dispassionately and listen. But on a pretrial, you're a conciliator, you're an arbitrator, mo mostly a conciliator, and you're working constantly to try and get a fair, just resolution to that dispute. And some time ago when we were getting, we were embryonic in the pretrial area, some of the judges felt that this wasn't their function, that their function was to try cases. But as Mr. Justice Haynes said um, long before he became a judge, the purpose of litigation is dispute resolution. And if the dispute resolution occurs between counsel having coffee after discovery, or before a pretrial judge, or after a judgment, society is well served. Well, I, all I can tell you is what I do. Uh, I have to be fair to the litigants, and uh, the, the integrity of the system is more important than any single settlement, no matter how big or complicated it is. And uh, if, if my figure on what the case is worth or my position um, on, on liability differs from both counsel, I state it, because I can only do that job if I do it objectively, and I'll only be successful the second time around because I'm perceived as being objective and fair. And I think that um, I sometimes it's embarrassing because you do feel that there's a mid-path between counsel, and it may not be close to one pole, it may be fairly close to the middle. I'm embarrassed when I'm in that position, but if that's the way I feel, that's the way it goes. George? Well, I think we've uh, I think we've found another mechanism to deal with that now. We're doing mid trials, and they're working. And and very uh, Justice Holland and I have done it uh, a, a considerable amount, and uh, and a number of other judges have too. Uh, but where we're in the middle of a trial, and we cannot communicate with counsel because we don't know what what's coming up next, but we feel that uh, there's an awful expense involved for the clients. Call counsel in and say, how about a mid-trial on this? Holland's down the hall, and he told me he'd do it. And uh, he, uh, he favored me with one of those uh, little cases uh, a few weeks ago, and I said, I'd be delighted to. You indicated when we had coffee this morning you might do that. And I took the liberty of speaking to counsel on my case 
while I'm doing a mid-trial on yours, you're doing a mid-trial on mine, and we swap counsel. Both cases settle. <coughs> and it, it, uh, it works. It works if counsel are, are objective. Now, you can't be as objective on, well, you can on a mid-trial, but maybe not as much as you can on the pre-trial. The mid-trial judge isn't, isn't going to be involved further in the trial, but you're there and, and going on with the trial and uh, so that you're taking more of an adversarial posture than you might earlier at a pretrial. But it works, and it avoids the problem that you've addressed. Patrick? Do the pretrial judges typically read the um, discovery materials file? And if so, you can help the file with the discoveries? Well, um, as far as the discoveries are concerned, uh, I try I try to skip through them and get some flavor for them. Uh, if there's an awful lot of material to be read, there often isn't time to do that. But where I've got time, I like to look at the discoveries for two reasons. If the pleadings tell me that uh, this is a credibility case, and you can read that sometimes from the pleadings, then I like to look at the discoveries and see how the, uh, the party appears to come off. I also like to look at uh, the demeanor of counsel on the discovery and, and see whether, the, whether counsel is being objective or whether he's being ultra-defensive, as if there's something to hide. And one can often read something from that. But um, to be frank, there isn't time to read the discoveries fully uh, on every case.